Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. To get involved, go to xyadvisor.com or simply download the XY Advisor app. First Centier Investors is a global asset management group managing $247.3 billion of assets as at 30th of September 2021. They have 17 independent teams operating across equities, fixed income, listed and direct infrastructure and multi-asset led by principles of responsible investment and stewardship. They are home to FSSA Investment Managers, an Asian and global emerging markets equities investor. Stuart Investors, a pioneer in emerging market equities and sustainable investing. And Real Index Investments, a systematic equities manager. Look, today, strap yourselves in. Um, it's uh, Andrew Rocks here, and um, I've got the privilege of uh, talking to one of the industry's larrikins, uh, Dan Blatch, and um, uh, known for many things, but most recently, and, and quite professionally, uh, winner of the IFA Risk Advisor of the Year Award. In fact, I was there, and uh, at his speech, uh, he said that um, uh, this year they've paid a record number of claims, which is a constant reminder that perspective is everything and that life is not a dress rehearsal. He went on to say, you don't know what's around the corner, so please go home and hug your loved ones tonight. Now, at the function, he probably fast-tracked that. I think he hugged about 20 people as he was leaving the stage. So he's a guy full of passion, uh, Dan Blatch. Um, welcome to the XY podcast. G'day, Roxy. Thanks so much for uh, having me. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. And um, what I thought I'd, I'd kick off with is... Um, uh, is, is a bit of a story of how you've, how you've come to be. You know, we've had quite a few people in the past who've, who've gone down the psychology route and they've come into to financial planning, makes a lot of sense. But just tell me about sort of what you did, what you studied and what brought you into to where you are now and just, just a, a bit of that background of how you found your way into financial planning. Yeah, thanks, Roxy. It's, um, it's a great reminder, isn't it, really, that, in, you know, a life by design rather than default is sometimes a bit tricky and you You've sort of got to let it run and, and take you where you want to go. I um, it's interesting, good timing given the cricket season's just finished. I um, was never good enough as a cricketer, Roxy. I, I was really never good enough. Let's face well, it. Well, you could play for England. So <laughs> I, I, I was going to start in, uh, maybe eleven or did England, but the, the reality was I just wasn't good enough. But I loved cricket, and um, I used to sit around with my old man watching cricket and. Um, for ages, you'd see in the dressing sheds, there'd be this constant reminder of a guy, like always there, always in the sheds. And um, that's for our non-cricket fans. That guy was Errol Alcott, who for a long period was the Australian cricket team's physiotherapist. I think almost two decades, if memory serves me correct. I thought, oh, okay, so you can be in around that energy and you can have your passion and love for cricket, but not necessarily be on the field. And I said to Dad, what does that guy do? And he said, oh, he's a physiotherapist. I thought, wow, that's awesome. Physiotherapists just watch the Australian cricket team go around the world. This is amazing. I want to be an Australian. I want to be a physiotherapist. <laughs> I remember in year 10, I um, did do some work experience as a physio and the physios at that point in time, up at Lingard Private Hospital, actually, at Newcastle, um, did, a, did a pretty good job on ensuring that I realised not all physios are sports physios, but I, I wanted to pursue it nonetheless, but didn't get the marks, Roxy. You, at the time, and I'm not quite sure where it is now, you needed some really high marks, I didn't quite get there. So a colleague of mine suggested you do occupational therapy, do really well in year one, and then transfer over to physiotherapy, um, which is what I did. But I realised then in year one at university, life was bigger than school. Um, I went to an all-boys school at high and there were girls around Roxy and there was beer everywhere and attendance was optional. And uh, needless to say, I didn't get the marks to go over physiotherapy. So I finished my OT degree, did some great time at St. George Hospital, but pretty swiftly realised most physios and OTs do great work, but it's usually in a hospital setting. It's not with sports teams. So um, my dream of becoming an independent unit around the Australian cricket team faded quickly. But what I did learn was that um, primary health care wasn't for me. I've got huge admiration for allied health professionals, but it just wasn't me. Um, someone suggested I go and work within 
CTP and workers' comp. And that was my first ever full-time paid job at QBE where I was running claims, working with various stakeholders, injured um, and ill workers and members of the community who suffered from motor vehicle accidents and trying to rehabilitate them and working with doctors and the likes. And so I got my first hand sort of experience of working inside a large insurer and also understanding what people in pain and people who've gone through a traumatic event are dealing with. Um, so that was a really, really informative sort of part of my career. And, um, and how, how long, how long um, did you do that for? Yeah, I was um, at QBE. On the other for, side of the fence. Yeah, I was at QBE for a couple of years. And then, if I'm honest, Roxy, became a little bit jaded with the restrictive, um, at the time, workers' work cover legislation. Someone said, oh, if you want to be more creative with your rehab using your OT skills, why don't you consider working in claims management of income protection. And I was a boy in shorts, Roxy, I didn't know what income protection was. And jobs were going at this large French multinational um, called AXA. And, sure. and just to date yourself, Dan, what year was that? Oh, this is going back to 2000, 2001. Yeah. Right. So um, I just turned 40. So um, that was a while ago. But, but I really, really enjoyed my time at AXA. I learned all about all forms of, uh, life insurance lines. They understood what it meant to manage IP claims from short claims to long tail claims, the role that allied health and rehab programs have within it. I learned about manufacturing product at the time. Steve Curry and a few other mentors of mine and I, we built, built AXA Elevate. So I understood the distribution channel back then of life insurance products. Um, I worked with underwriters and understood the, the pain points that exist when actuaries are also pricing products. So it was a wonderful training ground for me and um when, when you're working in, in, in AXA we're, we're, we're a lot of the other team members from a medical background or, or from an actuarial background or, or sort of were you were you a, a different kind of a, a, an addition to the team that's right yeah in the claims team at the time I think there are a couple of other OTs and one other, one other physio and we would work uh, closely with the chief medical officer but yeah allied health professionals within that environment were more the exception than the rule right and it was just wonderful being part of such a big, big ship, you know, at the time. I was working under Adrian Emery, some sort of real um, champions of the time, Les Owen, and, and some various mentors of mine, Jack Harrop from Sun Life. And I just realised how the world of life insurance exists across different jurisdictions, how different markets are more advanced and mature than others. And I started helping advisors position protection to clients and that was using my sort of valid health background. I knew the difference between, you know, X, Y, Z's definition of a heart attack troponin levels. I remember presenting to a group of advisors one day talking about the benefits of pathological Q-wave movements in a definition versus troponin discharges. And I actually knew firsthand having worked at the St. George Hospital emergency discharge program, what it cost to amend a house when someone had had a stroke, what it cost when someone was involved in a motor vehicle accident, the exact cost of that home modification or what it meant to their life moving forward gave me a wonderful insight into being and, able to price that. And can I ask you, um, actually knowing the details of what, what the cost is to get the perfect outcome, how did it make you feel sometimes when you, you dealt with people who just didn't have the financial resources to kind of achieve what, what you wanted them to achieve? How did that make you feel? Well, at the time, I didn't know anything about it. That's the thing, Roxy. I'd come from an environment in the hospital where I didn't realise you could protect yourself for these sorts of circumstances. I had absolutely no idea. Um, so only when I began to embark on a career in advice, sitting on the client side of the table and specialising in this area, did I realise the benefit of <clears throat> transporting that risk to someone else. But when I was in it, I just didn't realise you had to rely on various uh, Commonwealth and, and government subsidies. So, so, so you're sitting there, you, 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 you're teaching financial planners sort of the nuances, the medical nuances of, of, of the products that they're, they're selling. And I suppose that's the old know your product rule. Um, mm -hmm. You know, people are rolling in, they're grabbing their croissant, they're having their coffee, they're barely, barely asleep and you're, you're entertaining them. What made you jump the fence? Oh, it's a great, great question because I think I'm hardwired to build assets and I think in my heart of hearts, Roxy, that's why primary healthcare wasn't for me. I, I have a deep passion and empathy for people um, who've um, found hard times, but I just don't think I'm very good at being that person on the, on the front line. And from a very early age, I was interested in building assets and I was commercially minded. 
Um, I've got a bit of a funny yard. Yeah, my first ever job was selling ice creams at the Sydney Cricket Ground with an old mate of mine. And um, I just became drawn to that role because you were remunerated directly with your output. And so whilst I recognised early on in my career, you've got to earn your stripes and there is a role to earning a salary. What often stuck in the back of my mind was I was limited or I had no control over my earnings or someone else had greater control over my earnings and my REM than myself. So I became quite passionate about building assets. And in fact, in my 20s, I was frankly too bullish, Roxy. I um, had a number of failed businesses. One was a, a, a toy business that I desperately tried to make work. We, 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 we drove a large bus called the Bilby Bus around to childcare centres selling products and had a few other failed businesses in my 20s. I was just so ambitious to build assets that crossing the bridge to deliver advice directly to Australians just seemed inevitable for me. But I was very fortunate, Roxy, to have the mentorship of Phil Young, a former AFA of the year, advisor, winner, and all the specialists up at AFRM to provide me with lots of guardrails, mentorship, and training along the way. And then I found my current partners today all the way back in 2011. It's, it's interesting that you mentioned um, uh, mentorship. Um, having been in the industry uh, some time yourself, um, there's a lot of a lot of people in XY are, are one, one, or, one or both ends of the spectrum. They're either, you know, looking to give back and, and um, maybe uh, give some of that great mentorship that they received, or they're young people just absorbing that because history does repeat. And you know, regardless of the changes in legislation and whatnot, the clients are still the clients. Um, and and what you're sort of articulating is that that health doesn't sit around and wait for royal commissions. You know, people continually get, are getting more diabetes. Apparently, that's got to do a fair bit with the guy at the SCG selling ice creams. But, you know, time <laughs> will tell um, who's culpable for that. And, and you know, um, there's there's a lot of other factors. So you mentioned a, a couple of, of mentors there. Was there any forums back 20, 25 years ago that you that really worked for you and, and maybe that are transferable uh, to this day and age? Uh, really, it was, I'm a bit of... I'm more, I'm more belly to belly, perhaps, than others, Roxy. I, I really live and breathe the human exchange. So sitting across the table from someone, um, you know, um, pressing their flesh is really part of my DNA. So albeit slow, organic, and not exactly scalable, I still find to this day some of the more valuable meetings are getting around mentors and peers around the table being vulnerable and sharing as much as possible. And I still stand by that today. Um, that there, We know this is a relationship game. It's sort of anchored in everything we do. Um, and I just think the more of those mentors you can foster, even if it is more labour intensive, be prepared to have a thousand coffees was a saying my old mentor gave me in my 20s. And I just tried to take one thing out of every one of those coffees. So um, and, and, and I suppose looping back to, to when you jump the fence, I'd be really interested... Um, to hear about the very first time you sat down and advised someone from the financial advice side um, rather than the health side and, and how it made you feel. And, and I suppose you don't know if you can remember back, you know, uh, and unpacking that meeting, but maybe you can, can you remember the, the, the granular of that or just give me an idea of, of, of that? And what year was that, Dan? Yeah, that was back in 2010-11 uh, and that would have been in my capacity as an advisor at AFRM, a wonderful training ground, an excellent specialist business and we'll touch on specialisation in a second, Roxy, but, um, you know, um, Phil Young, Nick Hathaway, Mark Hoskin, Dan Musumeci, Rob Vitnall, you know, these guys are absolute guns of, of the risk world. Um, just learning off a series of people, different styles, um, was a little daunting, of course it was, you know, you need to transfer your, your skills to another area, but frankly, it was all, all sort of inside me, just needed to be tailored to, to client language and, and, and ensuring that you capture that right for clients. But daunting, of course, absolutely. And, and I think, you know, I go back to my recollection and, and um, when I was doing life insurance, I was really playing catch-up football on the medical terms, you know, that wasn't something that, 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 that I was familiar with, my foundation learning, but... I think back, and if, if someone such as yourself or, or someone from medical background had actually been talking to me about life insurance, just the level of reassurance that I would have had, did you find that that, that you had a, a better level of positioning with people? That's the first question. And then did you ever do investments where you were almost a fish out of water? So it was kind of like a double-edged sword. I'm, I, I'm potentially awesome, Mr. and Mrs. Client, this, but 
maybe I might have the imposter syndrome over there. Maybe take me through that, Dan. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I found myself perhaps oversharing to clients on on various aspects. You know, another old mentor of mine, Chris Unwin, you know, used to always talk about the miracle cover being trauma. And I do love that phrase. And I still do use that phrase today. And how when we were designing trauma back in the day, certainly when we built Elevate, it really is a product that targets three key segments. As you know, those conditions that affect younger lives almost always born out of motor vehicle accidents so severe burns um you know quadriplegia uh, uh, uh paraplegia etc cetera, etc cetera, major head traumas of course those conditions that are more targeted to older lives dementia alzheimer's blindness deafness etc and of course those conditions that we all know only too well roxy that just don't discriminate cancer multiple sclerosis so just paid an ms claim unfortunately average age of diagnosis for ms for women in australia is 31 and most people don't yeah. know this. So if anything, Roxy, I found myself a little bit tired to too much data. <laughs> and an old, 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 old mentor of mine said, you've got to make sure you disturb and reinsure when it comes to protection. And I guess one of my early mistakes was just too much disturbing. <laughs> well, I've, I've, I've read a few and, sales books in my time, and there's a bunch of techniques for, for, for closing the, the client sale in inverted commas. But, you know, recanting into a pool of, of crying for half an hour must have been a really interesting one. It would have been yeah. quite the journey a lot of your clients would have had. And uh, you know, being handed a tissue, as you've then said, would you like to come on board, is, is just something maybe that, um, you know, we, we don't have enough time in today's session, but something you might want to put out as far as a, a technique. It's, uh, it could, could uh, be a ticket to the game. Oh, the funniest thing was all my mates would say I'm, I'm an overly optimistic, glass half full, energetic, Sort of kind of chap. I I I I'm I'm consider myself the luckiest man on the planet. Yes, here I am delving into rather serious, <laughs> you know, uh, sort of dire uh, sort of discussion. But what I learned pretty quickly, to your point on, um, you know, did you also do wealth? Yes, it's sort of in my early days I dabbled in it and pretty pretty swiftly realised it wasn't something I was passionate about. Nor did I have the experience and skills to really really believe that I was a guru in this space. And it was so, the timing was incredible, Roxy, because two of my old um, longstanding friends and mentors knocked on my door. Another business I, I sort of had, a bit of fun in my 20s, was I was trying to completely change the face of fan engagement of sport in Australia. And, um, uh, you know, ran a, ran a pretty fun sort of fan engagement group and won a Guinness World Record and ultimately in the end sold the solution to the National Rugby League. But... I learned so many great lessons out of that. And I was sitting in the New South Wales Rugby League Club where one of my partners and I had a tiny office. It was more like a sort of clothes closet. And I got a knock on the door and it was Angus Dockrell and Scott Douglas, some old mates of mine, my, my two current partners. <laughs> and they firstly laughed at my setup because <laughs> we were upstairs in the New South Wales League Club with no windows or doors. But then second said, uh, how are you going with this sort of fan engagement piece? And as much as I love my time in sports fan engagement, I pretty quickly realised there wasn't a lot of money in it and it was more sort of a passion and fun. And, and their timing was impeccable because those two are sort of leading wealth specialists. And they basically said, we've been struggling with protection. We need a guru like yourself. Would you entertain the idea of beginning some dialogue and beginning a partnership to, to help improve client outcomes? So this is with, um, with, with IMFG. Um, and, right. and you, you came on board, what, 2, 2 11, and it had been going a few years beforehand. Is that right? Yeah. So another great story because uh, both Scott and Angus left IPAC under some wonderful mentorship. Paul Clithero, Aaron Abbey, learned some sort of wonderful, wonderful skills and an excellent training ground. But, again, pretty swiftly realised that it's tough on your own. Small business is tough. Uh, I was a minnow amongst giants in my sports fan engagement days, you know, negotiating with the NRL around an arrangement to sell 18,000 tickets within an event that you're not the promoter of is, is um, a slight challenge when it's uh, just you and a couple of others. Um, so I guess what I've learned is... That's a, that's a lot of people in trench coats out the front um, asking <laughs> someone would they be interested in good seats. Uh, so um, you, you, did you have a Cockney accent? Because that's that's a lot of effort on that front. And maybe we'll come back to that because I'm, I'm not sure how many guests... Uh, in XY's history, have got a Guinness uh, world record. But um, I'll let you keep going with you, with you with how you you evolved your current business, and we'll probably retouch on that because it's 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 a cracker of a campfire story. So over to you. Yeah, that, thanks, mate. Thanks. But the, the reality was, I just 
you know, look, it's really daunting making this step to self-employment. It really, really is, is tough and tricky. Most business is fragile, Roxy. Even big business. We've got countless examples of that, let alone small business. And part of the thing I loved about my time with Blatches is we had a hell of a lot of fun along the way. And I, I stand by your opening of the fact that life isn't a dress rehearsal. You know, you might not be here tomorrow. I see it every day of the week. So you've got to have fun along the way. And so when Angus and Scott knocked on my door, having tried to sort of go on their own and they were running successful businesses at the time, but realised that we would be stronger together and that coming together gave us an opportunity to stick to our knitting and stay in our lane in areas where, frankly, we were more comfortable and better suited was a real eye-opener. But to do that, of course, you've got to find the right guys and culture is everything and shared values is everything. And so it's not easy to find them. I agree with that. But certainly going along in a business journey with people, in my experience, not only is more enjoyable, but typically can deliver better outcomes. Yeah, and, and um, uh, my, old, my, my business coach and, and, and my current partner, Dave Carney, 15 years ago, he, he sort of said that uh, this industry, financial planning, uh, is, is going to evolve into hyper-specialisation as far as um, how it works. And, and uh, I suppose years ago, it was that hard to get a client that you, you really were paranoid about letting them go because everyone, you know, to, to, to nick a, um, a medical term, everyone was a general practitioner, okay? And not that there's anything wrong with that, but what's happened in the evolution of, of, of financial advice is that we are moving more towards, dare I say, the medical one where... Yes, you might be a fantastic uh, a general practitioner and you might be great at counselling the person, but when you need those specialists, when you need the, 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 the risk specialist or, you know, the, the, the estate planning specialist, we're a lot more comfortable now in actually uh, sharing our clients for their overall betterment than we ever were. And, you know, most people have that in a, in a sort of referral arrangement or, or just a professional arrangement. But from what I've, I've read about your firm, that's something that's, that's very entrenched in-house and that, that, that you guys have your swim lanes. And, and, and maybe give me a feel for how the client experience is. You know, do you come in and do you leave? Or, or what, what's, what's, what does the client feel about having these series of specialists um, from your perspective? Yeah, it's a great, great, great point, Roxy. And I guess I'll go back a step there just to say I hear loud and clear with that. I think um, perhaps uh, older styles of financial planning, as you, you've touched on, it, it, this is really a supply issue, isn't it? So in the past, you've got a client and you wouldn't dare sort of perhaps refer them out or not try and extract, if you will, or provide more opportunities or advice to them, even if perhaps you, you felt it might not have been in your lane. I, I think... You've got to give to get, and you've got to go small to get big. And I think having a niche is huge. And you look at the American model, you know, having your niche, as they say, and I'm sure your listeners to your the American podcast would support this, is sometimes you've just got to understand that um, passing up an opportunity is actually better for you. And it actually is a win-win-win for everyone. It's a win for a client. It's a win for you. You get to do more of what you do better of. Frankly, you can have deeper engagements with the relative people around you. And then you're not distracted by various events throughout the way. I mean, I'm going on record to say that one of Angus's and Scott's favourite things is that they no longer have to do risk or all the wealth specialists in our business. They don't have to touch it anymore. So... I can really focus on my claims process, which is a big part of our offer. I can focus on having deep relationships with chief underwriters. I mean, you don't get direct lines to chief underwriters if you're sort of dabbling in lots of things. And I believe I get better claims outcomes for clients. I get better underwriting outcomes for clients because I live and breathe this discipline. And I would suggest to others that um, if it's something that you've got a passion for, really explore it because I think it will come across to your clients. And don't worry about not being able to extract all the perceived value that you might get out of a client. It'll return it in spades. And everyone wins because you do more of what you love. I suppose, look, it'd be wonderful um, uh, to be uh, able to speak to uh, chief underwriters when, you, when you're when you very, very cr across the, the medical lingo. Um, maybe uh, as just, just to impart some knowledge on that claims process. And a lot of people, you know, we've, we've done a lot of uh, sort of material out there on how to get clients, how to curate that. But at the other end, you know, at the, at the real gritty end of, of, of being a life insurance advisor and looking after people's families, what are some of the, you know, what are your top sort of two or three things that, 
but you do at claim time that, that you'd be w- willing to share that, that makes a big difference to both from, from the insurer and, and, and the client side. And, and also, what are just the common things you see? Because you would pick up clients from other uh, other people over the years or self-insured people. What are just the common mistakes? So maybe have a crack at those two, Dan. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Roxy. Well, the first thing I'll say, just going back to your point on CX, is that IMSG, every client gets a relationship manager. It might not necessarily be the risk advisor. It might not necessarily be our aged care specialist, but they've got a touch point, usually for someone that's introduced the client into the business that stays throughout so that they know they've got a team of people working around them. Um, That actually is a great advantage for our advisors, knowing that it's not just them, but there is support for them when practical things like they go on leave or they're ill. Uh, And then a house of specialists come and dial in and out should be required. This allows us to offer more intergenerational advice. It allows us to give the client comfort to say, we actually aren't great in this space, or I'm going to roll in Matt, or I'm going to roll in Lizette, who's a guru in this space. I think that fills people with confidence because, again, it identifies the fact that you are vulnerable in certain advice areas, and I think it's okay to say that. Um, And so that person is always across every piece of comms and detail for the client, which we think is important. And that extends then to my claims process too, Roxy. I think that's the most important thing, get a lot of people involved in the process. The first thing is, if I think it's a clear-cut process, I actually have either an aged care specialist, if it's suitable, or a wealth specialist with me in that initial meeting. Because it could be that there are tax ramifications and wealth ramifications to any potential claim. I think that's an important point, along with one of my associates to be there. So just to clarify, this is at claims, not at time of... of, of At at claims. At at claims. At claims. At claims, because I think it's important that the claimant and their family understand that we're not just coming at this from getting a successful claim proceeds perspective. We're coming at this from, this has been a large event in your life, typically, and I'll go on to the way we approach short-term claims shortly as well, Roxy. Secondly, you might need a team of people around you to make decisions around how it is that you're going to potentially invest this money, how you're going to deploy this money, what structure it's going to go to. Are you going to take advantage of the financial planning benefit that still exists in so many claims? Absolutely. And, and there's also, you know, there's a risk that if you get the tax advice wrong and you're unadvised or ill-advised, um, you take a lump sum and, and before you know it, you've, you, you've completely decimated the intention of, 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 of the insurance. 100%, 100%. And there are occasions where at that point in time, I'll also bring the client solicitor along um, to talk through that. But first things is I go and meet with the claims assessor and their manager. Right. I find that critical. Some people might find that that's uh, how do you and how do they role? respond to that? I mean, it's uh, it's it sounds good, but you know, I think we've got thousands of people who will be listening to this. This and we're probably now got a lot of scared claims assessors, you know, <laughs> <laughs> wondering how they're going to hire security guards and barricade the doors. So, I mean, clearly yeah, you've got a, a, a long relationship, but how do you how do you position yourself? Um, in a in a calm and logical way so that you can have those meetings with, with those claim assessors. 100%. And, of course, meetings aren't meetings in 21 and, uh, 22 and beyond, as you know, Roxy. I'm not necessarily meaning a face-to-face meeting, but certainly an opportunity to build a relationship via facial recognition with the claims assessor subject to the claims manager's um, um, support. And in my experience with the insurers I work with, the claims managers are very supportive advisors who are part of the process and want to get to know the assessor and the process from here. I think just in the same way as you would embark on a relationship building exercise with a new client, we should treat every claim the same. The second thing is, are there ways we can expedite this for all? And I was part of a project back at AXA, Roxy, that talked about long, medium and a short, medium and long-term claims. And a lot of claims can be paid within the first six-month period swiftly. It saves for admin costs amongst many other costs that the insurer has to bear. And just to specify, are you you talking about lump sum or you're talking about sort of income protection or or where do you make the distinction? um, Yeah, so I'm talking, as you know, um, trauma is quite binary, by and large, quite binary. So it's it's less, perhaps negotiation, if you will, or or it's it's rather clear cut. Was it partial or was it full? But talking more on an IP side of things, which is where I was previously not a claims assessor. And I know if there is a way that we've got an advisor and a claimant on board who's open to coming to the table around the negotiation of what this could look like and save all parties uh, across the table, it it works um, extremely well. I have a lot of success with that. 
it might be that we forego what could have frankly been one month of partial payment or two months of a TD payment. But if we can simply get that done, it might be a 30 day wait and save everyone the trouble, we move on. The claimant can move on. They see value in the protection. The claims department saves costs. So I'd, I'd really encourage people to get their, roll their sleeves up and get their hands dirty with claims departments. Go to a Luca. Get to know claims professionals. I know we continue to focus on the underwriters because ultimately that gets our clients' business across the door. But it's the claims in when you will really get ROI for all the work you've been doing. And yeah, sure, maybe I've got an advantage having been in claims myself in the past, but but I'd encourage people to invest heavily there. Oh, absolutely. And do you see, um, you know, uh, in my experience, um, we had uh, many clients claim and, and and some of those clients claimed on on advice and, and, and insurance recommendations that we had indeed done in the past, but other ones were claiming on, on products either bought directly uh, through a group policy or, or, or previously done. And, and we... We uh, had markedly different experiences. Um, do you get many uh, of the latter to where, where you're doing claims for, for, for advice that was done not by yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah, and I treat it exactly the same way. I treat it exactly the same way. That's where you can earn some huge respect from the client. That's where that one to five existing client referral ratio will kick off. For every one claim I manage, I see it as a huge opportunity to help the client and ultimately to be an advocate for myself and my business, irrespective as to whether I was the advisor that initially provided the advice or not, yeah, whether it's retail industry group. And, and, and Dan, you don't have to answer this if you don't, don't feel like it, but... Um... You know, there's been a, a there's always been, sorry, an incidences of where where lawyers have offered their services um, at a at a fee uh, quite often that's either um, uh, uh, extremely excessive or very excessive for what they're doing. Where do you do you see any part um, of the claims process um, being uh, where where lawyers should get involved? Is there or, or do you see that there should be a, a line in the center? And uh, you know, I'm just after your thoughts on that particular subset of what goes on in the loosely defined financial services. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting uh, subject matter. We could go on for a long time on this. Um, certainly, you know, there are entire business models that are built around this. We, we probably won't go into that from various parts of the legal fraternity. I'm married to a lawyer and all of my uh, in-laws are lawyers, uh, Roxy, so I, I know enough to be dangerous in that world. Um, but, but the reality is there are, I do believe there are, circumstances where early legal advice in the process does serve you, your client, and the insurer well. And I'm specifically talking about TPD, where there can be some ambiguity. And I know my sister-in-law is an excellent lawyer. And one area, and something she said to me many, many moons ago, is employment law is a ridiculously complex area that not even um, uh, lawyers choose to dabble in. There are a lot of lawyers that are very specialised in this space. And I think that as a, to give cite one example there, Roxy, is one area where if indeed there is some ambiguity around what's transpired, particularly with mental health in the workplace, I think that's an excellent place um, to get a, a, a trusted professional in the corner of you and, and the client. Yeah, that is cracking advice. Um, a lot of people in, in, who run their own small to medium-sized business in financial advice, um, they've engaged uh, solicitors um, and many of them have engaged employment solicitors, but that's quite often to assist in employment contracts or potentially disputes. Um, what you're saying is when, when you're actually in the room talking to that employment lawyer, maybe you should have a coffee afterwards off the clock and say, well, you know, if this circumstance arise, you know, would you be interested in working with me to assist the client, particularly in a, in a, in a total and permanent disability sort of definitional uh, process? Yeah, and, and the one thing I'll say there is, you know, we know a large part of the fact that disability lines are bleeding. There's, I appreciate there's a lot of levers that are contributing to that, but a big part of it, as you know, Roxy, and, and your listeners would appreciate, is mental health. And I do a lot of work with one insurer around um, loading for mental health rather than excluding for mental health, and a lot of my clients are in that legal fraternity. And as you know, it's a sensitive subject matter, it's increasingly being discussed, and I think rightly so, particularly amongst the men's health cohort, which is something I'm passionate about. Uh, and State of Mind was a project that we, we ran um, in my time in Blatchy's Blues around getting men to talk more openly about their mental health. So it's a huge area of interest for me. And I, I think the more work we can do to encourage underwriters to be more creative with the terms that they offer, 
and then ultimately for claims assessors to be more creative potentially with claims payments around mental health and um, putting putting an individual's health front and foremost is is just critical. So I, I, th I think mental health in the workplace and where that could potentially be going with TPD is an area we can work closely with solicitors on. I think you've just, you've, you, you know, you've, you've absolutely impressed me um, in, in that area of specialisation. I mean, just having the, the courage to, to use the word creative when you're going through a financial planning process um, is, 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 is actually really, really sort of invigorating. And you're right. I mean, um, everyone wants to have a solution and, you, you know, sometimes you need to, to um, uh, come to the table and, and work through things for the betterment of, of, of all parties, most most importantly your clients. And just, yeah. I just wanted and, to and just, just sorry, Rox, before I just sorry. push on. Sorry, mate. Just quickly, one final thing I'll say there in the workplace is I run seminars um, within um, workplaces, and I we all know how increasingly difficult it is to place retail business at the moment. We understand, certainly those that have been around for a while, understand how hard underwriting has become in certain facets, particularly in this COVID climate. One area that I'm incredibly passionate about and, and frankly, I'm becoming quite successful in at the moment, and I'd encourage all your listeners to really give it a crack, is you know get, get to know key decision makers of businesses because Group policies seem to be this forgotten, long-lost cousin. You know, when I first started out, a great mentor of mine at AFRM spoke to me about the role of group cover, and I just still think a huge obligation of employers in this country is going to move Roxy on an evolution from, you know, fruit bowls in the canteen, massages, you know, over, over sort of... Um, frankly, capitalised end of year parties and Christmas parties. I'm not saying go, go out and have a good time, but I think the future of employers and their obligation to their teams is going to be around not only financial advice, which we can all contribute to in various mediums, but understanding that we're remunerating our team for their work, but we're also protecting that remuneration and giving that confidence to their clients. I think GSC is a huge growth opportunity in this country. Um, and again, being a specialist in that area just gives me the opportunities to talk more deeply with the group insurers, to talk more deeply with the HR Institute around how we can encourage employers to consider that more. I've been working with Ari around that, but I just encourage your, your listeners, really don't forget about group. You might not have got a policy on the books yet. You might feel like you're a bit at sea if you're recommending it. But if it is something that you want to consider, I encourage you to go and speak to key decision makers of businesses because they, their staff will love them. It's a huge win. It's a benefit for employers and for employees. And, and, and look, on that topic, Dan, I feel, I feel like that, that um, the, the engagement with group policies um, really has, has not been uh, part of financial planning landscape for probably 10, 15 years. And in reality, it probably got phased out at the same time as, as corporate super did, where people would do a corporate super, they'd then engage, um, you know, they'd do a, a, a seminar in the workplace, talk about things. But, um, you know, as that unraveled, for, for reasons that are good and bad, um, you know, I, I feel like group policies were just sort of thrown, thrown, thrown in the same sort of dustbin as far as a, a business model. So, you know, very interesting. And um, uh, I imagine that um, there's probably a whole other um, sort of informative session that we could put myself on, on group policies, which would be, you know, um, really well received. Um, I just wanted to, um, uh, you know, change gears a bit. Um, and you mentioned about uh, mental health and you mentioned about um, uh, what you've done there uh, in mental health. And, and, and truth be known, um, all the insurers in, in, in the Australian market uh, are trying their best and, and they're, variously they're putting out great initiatives and great information and great data. But um, it's, and, and uh, I, I suppose, What's your thoughts? Maybe take me through the, the state of mind um, project that you did do and maybe even rewind back because, you know, if, if, I'm, if I'm Googling your name, um, financial planning is not the first thing that comes up, Dan Blatch, <laughs> a.k.a. Blatchy. So maybe take me through uh, the, the, the roller coaster of uh, how you got to become synonymous and the name of, of sort of sports fan uh, at least in the, in the in the rugby league states, and and and, and how you then leverage that into doing something more purposeful. So uh, maybe take take us back to where that began. Yeah, thanks, Roxy, and it is a good segue too because I think it's got some deep uh, identity. It's got some um, collegiate and community components to it, and 
you know, I was just having a whole bunch of fun. Frankly, mate, back on my 18th birthday, I just wanted to find a way to get together with all the lads without any other distractions. And so, you know, bought bought uh, bought 25 tickets. I saved up all my ice cream money. <laughs> bought 25 tickets from Ticketek. I, I remember it well. And uh, I went to St Mary's Cathedral in town. And at lunchtime, you're allowed to duck out. So I ran across the uh, Hyde Park and... I thought, what can we do to stand out, Roxy? And if you can recall, this is back in 1999. I know I'm showing my age. So just to clarify, um, the, the Catholic Church was also masquerading as a ticket tech. So uh, is, that, is that what you're saying here? Was it, is, is, they've, they've diversified revenue streams over the years. But anyway, carry on. No, no St Mary's Cathedral wasn't selling tickets to the origin out the front, I can assure you. But, um, you know... I, I just thought, oh, how can we do this? And I thought, how can we stand out? And it was just before the Olympics, because this is 1999. And if you can recall, those wings that they had out there at Stadium Australia, as they called it at the time, the capacity was 118,000. I thought, gosh, you know, I think it is still other than the MCG game uh, to this day, one of the records. But I thought, how can I stand out? And I thought, oh, you know, there's, there's, there's Gowings. I know what I'll do. I'll run into Gowings, you know, the original department store. And I bought 13 Navy Terry Cowling hats and 12 light blue Terry Cowling hats for the 25 of us and insisted the lads, you know, sort of sat one by one. And of course, you know how these things pan out. Roxy, we were in the nosebleed section. There was sideways rain. We were getting wet and, you know, I don't think we had any sort of TV coverage. So I swore to do it better the next year. And I've got 50 guys and that's where the blue wig was born. I went to um, uh, the party people down at South and Susie on the St. George Boy and bought 50 blue wigs and we went and went and grew and grew and grew from there and I said at our peak I think we had about 18 and a half thousand people in there taking sort of the whole bay down down the south but I learned so many wonderful lessons from that and I think coming back to the community-minded mental piece mental health piece there was that you know I say in my bio on our site that we really are social creatures and ultimately we we just want to be a part of something all of us and Something that's still a bit of a frustration for mine is the, the, the seemingly sport and its desire to plaster up the you know white Anglo-Saxon 17 to 25-year-old bunch of guys inebriated sort of screaming down the camera, which ultimately back then I was. But as I grew along and had a little bit longer, I realised actually it's about that person who doesn't have any friends or who doesn't have anyone that wants to come together and belong and be a part of something. And it was quite an egalitarian model in that you didn't have to do anything we didn't sing songs you just threw a wig on and you know you could be around a bunch of like-minded people Dan, it was it was more than that i've been at at state of origin viewings where people are watching the tv wearing your 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 blue wigs and as you say uh men who are historically relatively poor at, at at sort of uh sharing and 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 growing outside of a sporting sort of club there you know, getting together and sharing stories and, and 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 whatnot is not not normal. But but I saw that 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 was a large part of what you were doing. And I think the game was only just really a small component to the overall effect of it. Um, so that that was my that's my take an outside looking in. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, often we make things too complex, and and an egalitarian approach should be all encompassing and. Um, I think all supportive of people from different walks of life, not just men, but I, I think typically men in Australia have done a, not such a good job in opening up around that. So the state of mind was a was a campaign that we, what's your state of mind using the state of origin sort of pun there and, and being open to talking to other people about it. It's okay to talk about things if you're not doing well. Um, and and I, I think we're increasingly doing that, but um, ironically tying back to our sort of um, work conversation is interestingly that's having an effect on claims isn't it so you know who would have thought actually 10 or so years ago could have potentially seen um this large wave of particularly men but lots of australians talking about how they're feeling around depression anxiety stress uh and some of the pressures that exist so i hope covid's a bit of a wake-up call for all of us around this um and i think some of the work i'm doing with underwriters around and this is why you going back to your word creativity uh, uh, can we be creative with our underwriting? Can we offer limited terms with a loading? Can we offer, not? it's not a blanket mental health exclusion, it only covers anxiety or it only covers bipolar, not to be sort of you know, blanketed with all of these exclusions and, uh, and and completely nutted out. It's a difficult conversation to have to exclude rather than to load. Yeah, and just the confidence 
um, in, in in your knowledge um, in, in saying that is is something that's that's not not universal. It's not universal for advisors um, who uh, might be doing a, a life insurance as part of their own a holistic offering um, or it might just be new advisors so you know it's uh, we'd all love to be have have your brain and have done you know an ot uh, degree and worked in hospitals but but we haven't and, and you know getting back to that whole specialization um you know what's uh, apart from attempting to uh, raise four kids under the age of six or seven um, which would have been a lockdown <laughs> delight um and a long-suffering wife what 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 are you up to these days, and where where is your business at today, and and and, and where where do you see the, the the future for yourself? Yeah, thanks, thanks for that's a great question. Look, I actually had a quiet champagne with my wife at New Year's, and we just reflected on the year that was, and um, it was probably the biggest year of our lives, really. Our business got our own Australian Financial Services license. Um, we put on three new advisors. Uh, we embedded a, um, as I say, I won the award. I had my fourth child under the age of seven. Unfortunately, my sister got breast cancer. I mean, we've all got these stories. So it was a monumental year for me. So uh, the 30-second version of what I'm looking to do this year is just to have a, a slightly less busy year and, and continue to cherish um, my beautiful family, which I'm so fortunate to have, and, and hug them as much as possible. But what, what, what we've learned in our business is that if you're passionate like me about building assets, typically old financial planning has been, you know, Dennis Deneuve above the butcher shop, battle with the leasing agent around, you know, negotiating your new lease, you lease you might buddy up with the accountant or the mortgage broker, you're, you're banging your head on the printer because the, the Dell printer guys, you know, sold you a melon or didn't tell you about the colour printing charges and taking the rubbish out as well you're also the janitor oh by the way you need to do marketing and everyone's telling you to do socials and oh you need some support and goes on and on and on and particularly in our game i've always said if you don't like change get out of financial planning the only constant in this world is change but it seems to be on steroids with financial planning get busy living or get busy dying and what i've learned is it's just really hard on your own it's really hard on your own, but there's typically been a gap. You've either got to be that Dennis Denudo above the butcher shop in the burbs, or you're part of sort of some behemoth, you know, conglomerate. Where's the gap? I'm not it? sure that, that Safe Harbour is defined as the vibe, but I'll let you keep <laughs> referencing Dennis. <laughs> yes, Dennis, the, <laughs> the vibe. I love that scene. I love that scene when Eric Banner and his wife comes back and they're at Bonnie Doon and they're talking about the plane story. Oh, they gave you movies. It was movies, you know, and they were free. Yeah, I love that movie. I think it just got voted Australia's best ever movie. Anyway, um, and the thing that there sort of has been a gap. So we've recognised that we and we built this model, which really we think is win, win, win. And I'm not just saying that. I do believe it's a very generous model, having seen it compared to many others. Whereby there's advisors who might have been going out on their own, maybe they're considering self-employment, or they have been self-employed for a while and can operate under our business, sit on the client side of the table, knowing that they've got the confidence and sustainability that are operating under a, an own AFSL holder. So they're always going to be sitting on the client side of the table, not the shareholder side of the table. It's part of the reason why we left IPAC and AMP. And also recognise that you can retain 100% ownership in your existing business. You can take advantage of a collegiate environment with a group of professionals who all want to grow together centralised admin functions and then we grow together in a in an arrangement whereby new new business is captured in a series of models. I won't go into that now, but what it allows people to do, Roxy, is have that asset that they've worked so hard to build or, or want to build, but not have to struggle with all that stuff that we do. The great picture of Angus Scott and I drinking a case of DB Throwdown because it was all you could get our hands on when we um, got our first lease at Goldfields House all those years ago. And we literally moved furnish, furniture from Angus's uh, dad's business in the Lower North Shore. And Scott hired the truck. And, you know, from our first hire, which was the shared admin support, support uh, God bless you, Lacey, we still love you, mate, um, all the way up to our team at 17 now. What we've learned is it's just tough and really hard yakka on your own. And I say life's not a dress rehearsal, you've got to have fun along the way. And for a lot of people, building that asset comes with some trade-offs. And one of those trade-offs is you're on your own. You know, it's really hard to sort of do on your own. So it's, it's one of the one of the biggest sort of um crazies is that 
the types of people who get into financial planning are quite often people who, you know, back when they were at school and potentially at undergraduate uni and whatnot, they were, you know, very, very talkative, very communicative, uh, you know, be very interested in people, very interesting to people. And then, you know, we, we put them into a box that they didn't sign up for, especially if they're in small businesses. And, and from what I've seen, businesses have, you know, a couple of early capacity hurdles. One's around that 10 employees. It's hard mm-hmm. to get to 10. You muck around there for ages. And the next one's that, that kind of 30. And, and with that in mind, the, the decisions that you have to make um, on the operations of the business at, at, at 10 and 30 are different. You guys are halfway between. Um, how do you feel that you're going? And is, and is, is pushing through and getting that larger scale business, which, which hopefully will translate to you know, a quality delivery your objective for, or are you looking to consolidate what you've got now? No, we're definitely looking for like-minded professionals that are committed to advice and have a runway. But frankly, just might be a bit tired of doing it all on their own. You know, they're sick and tired of being the marketer, the janitor, the, the compliance guru, and et cetera, et cetera. I appreciate that there are different models and horses for courses, Roxy. You know, some people love the idea of being part of a boutique lifestyle, but there's certainly benefits, and I think that's pronounced in today's climate of scale. And so... Um, we're happy with where we're going. We're always building capacity, uh, Roxy, but, you know, they always say in business, you're never going as well as you think you're going and you're never going as crap as you think you're going. And I um, I sort of feel that going along the way, having fun along the way and building teams, people underestimate how challenging it is to build teams, as you rightly point out, and you know that only too well, that building award-winning teams, great places to work. I mean, you know that intimately well. It takes time. Um, curating a team of like-minded people, shared values is difficult. And there's certainly a capacity point when you're running your own show around that first hire, how it eats into your eats into your profit. And I think the key theme here is that old world financial planning, Roxy, might have been FOM, uh, dealer group, AOR, these sorts of things. And new world, as your uh, listeners will certainly attest, is professionalism, people, process, sustainable profit and whether or not you're embarking on what I believe is my definition of a business which is a commercial profitable enterprise that works without you or not whether or not you're sort of destined to be that prof services employee that's fine but I certainly think there's benefit in partnering up with people to go on that journey will there's huge benefits in terms of business valuation shifting from AOR valves into EBIT as we all know but you've got to be with like-minded people to do that because you see time and time again, culture and values going right, going astray and not quite working out. And as you know, it's difficult to unscramble eggs. So you've got to take the time to get to know, like, and trust people. And once you've done that in business, the rewards are there. So certainly yeah, we'd yeah. encourage any of your listeners that, that want to have a coffee and, and, and engage in that conversation. We'd love to chat with them. Oh, and, and Dan, on, on that note, where, whereabouts are you located? Where, which, which, which state or...? or, or um, yeah, we're in, we're in Sydney, um, Sydney CBD, and also we've got an advisor in Melbourne and about to appoint another advisor in Melbourne. So I'm at the 11th hour of talking to an advisor in Brisbane as well. So it's less okay. about bricks, bricks and mortar and where you are. It's more about values, what your uh, moral compass, how it's aligned, and your commitment to advice. And Dan, look, I've had a, um, a a real real sort of um, treat today. It's uh, you know when you peel back the onion layers, as um, as one said, um, you know from the outset, uh, you, you're a very joyous and 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 your, your background indicates you know the fun and excitement. But there is there is a, a real sort of steely disposition to the passion um, of of serving people um, in come claim time, um, and because you don't sell insurance for the fact of selling it. You, you sell it for the, 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 the possibility and probability of, of actually doing the claim. And, and I think that's, um, uh, don't, don't ever lose that, that passion, Dan. Um, I'm sure that, um, that, that uh, you, you're a hoot to work with. And, and I'd like to thank you uh, for your time today. We didn't actually get round to the Guinness World Record, but um, uh, maybe if you could give us the, uh, the outclose of what, what, what your Guinness World Record is, and then I'll probably come at the end and say that's irrelevant to what you're delivering for us. Yeah, so, exactly. of, of well, so, so over to you. Mate, there are, some, there are some synergies there, believe it or not. It's a real hoot. Um, uh, I was flicking around with one of my partners. You know those big Guinness World Record books? They're massive. They're sort of doorstops, you know, and I was flicking around sort of before it was online and having a look, and believe it or not, there was a category. Couldn't believe it. It was destiny, Roxy. There was a category which had already been achieved. Most number of people wearing wigs 
in a stadium. Can you believe it? I was like, what is this? <laughs> anyway, it was held by a billionaire. I think he's a billionaire who owns the Los Angeles Angels. He owns a number of um, sporting sort of uh, 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 businesses and clubs around the world. We, we now refer yeah. to him as first loser. Yeah, well, well, it's so funny. I'm having a lovely battle with him over the years, you know, and he held it for eight and a half thousand people in an LA Angeles game. And I thought, we can do this. We can definitely do this on the numbers we had. And, um, I, you know, I started to begin, it's harder than it thinks, Roxy. I had to engage an army of volunteers to count no more than 100 seats. But during the first five minutes of the game, you had to sort of have it verified. It was quite a project. And again, it can, can I ask, did you have Donald Trump's people who count crowds or did you, did you have <laughs> yeah, a sort of a more of a, an independent uh, sort of uh, arbiter? <laughs> One, two, miss a few. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You know, we eventually got it done and the final number was 12,800, I think it is, and, and got the award presented on the ground and that was just so much fun. And then this is the best bit of the yarn, talking about vulnerability, you being put in your place. Nine months later, Roxy, word gets out that this Los Angeles guy who owns a you know, zillion clubs has found out he's lost this award. <laughs> His marketing team has said, hey, man, Bob, what's happening here, you know? Anyway, the next home game, literally the next home game, he gives everyone a red wig. Everyone, all 36,000 LA Angels fans that came in got a red wig. And so I only held it for nine months or something like that. But talk about being a one-man band against a billionaire and attracting his attention. Well, well, <laughs> a bit well, of a well, you've, had, you've, had, you've had nine months of the peak there and, and, and sort of 25 solid years in finance planning. I'd like to thank you for your, for your time, Dan, it was it was always going to be hoot. And um, um, if people want to reach out to to you or anything you said there, there'll be plenty of links, and um, they can always reach out to the good team at X Y Boys. Um, but with that in mind, thanks for sharing your story and your passion. And I look forward to uh, seeing you soon. Cheers, Dan. Thanks, Roxy. Amazing. Thanks, mate. Really appreciate the opportunity. Cheers, mate.